Right. Good morning then. Uh, today uh, we'll continue with our discussion on Christian Shandy. And uh, uh, in the last class we had talked about the, uh, the challenges to plot, character and time that Stern posed in Christian Shandy. Uh, today what we shall deal with is fundamentally the other challenges to the book and to enlightenment philosophy that Stern makes in this particular novel. I hope my uh, PowerPoint is visible to you. Is it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, Thank sir. You. Right. Now, uh, there's one particular point which I wanted to make also about Tristram Shandy, in that it is a novel which is marked by intertextuality. Right. So, uh, in a sense, intertextuality, as many of you know, is a term used by Julia Kristeva. And uh, it talks about how books often are in dialogue with books and how that sort of reflects on the ideology of the book and uh, the various uh, uh, parodic uh, strategies that the author wants to use. Therefore, one of the characteristic metafictional ploys that Stern uses, and remember this is a book that is challenging, you know, the, almost all the notions of the realist novel that we have, is intertextuality. Stern himself calls Tristram Shandy a book of books and uh, uh, it's part of his initiative, imitative plays to draw upon earlier texts in order to expose narrative conventions. So what are these books that he's talking about? Now we mentioned of course that in the treatment of the philosophers Gloriosus, Stern is using the a model of Rabelais in Gargantua and Pantagruel. And uh, therefore, Walter Shandy, as it were, becomes a figure who displays his pedantry. Now, there's also the use of Burton's The Anatomy of Melancholy and Erasmus's The Praise of Folly. All of these are essentially books which uh, mimic or uh, which sort of parody scholasticism, you know, the use of learning for the sake of learning. And therefore, it's mocking the scholastic quibble using uh, Burton and Erasmus. Uh, this, as you can see, achieves two purposes. One is satirizing the learned blockheads. And uh, the other, which is more important, I think, is to thwart and foil uh, any univocal interpretations. Now, Stern also uses this term, hobby horse, that I referred to uh, when we discussed uh, the notion of character to Erasmus. Uh, and therefore, you see, part of it is uh, the ridiculing of the attempt to draw upon a single system that rationalizes and explains experience. Stern sees exp experience as something which is multidimensional. So, Whenever realism tries to sort of locate a character within a particular trait, Stern is extremely satirical. Now, the other major author or the major text in the text for Stern is that of uh, the uh, of Cervantes, Don Quixote, and you know, one of the ploys of Cervantes is always to turn the gaze back to the way of storytelling. Now, if you've seen that Cervantes' Don Quixote is taken up by this entire segment of romances so that he starts believing. And the entire parody of uh, Don Quixote is a series of adventures whereby, you see, the reality comes into conflict with the fictionality. Right. The fictional representation of reality is seen as something which is which is fiction and which is untrue. And therefore, at every step, the mismatch between the experience and the representation is something that Cervantes satirizes. Right. So here also, you know, the the other quixotic character here would, of course, be Uncle Toby. 
Now, if this is one segment, Stern's challenge to, you know, plot, character, digressions, and uh, and time, then the other major challenge that Stern posits is to punctuation. Now, Stern does this by the use of what I'll call a number of punctuational forms. Stern is satirizing and telling us that what we are reading is actually a book. So he is foregrounding the physicality of the book and the words written upon the black page. Now you might say, so what's special about that? But you see, what realism does is it tries to see fiction as a kind of a mirror of life. So it's a kind of a transparent lens through which you can represent reality. What Stern is doing is he is deliberately making or foregrounding the fact that this is a physical book and it is a physical representation rather than reality. Right. So by drawing our attention to the book, Stern is drawing attention to the unreality of the book, right? Its departure or its, or its what you can say, difference from reality. So how does he do this? For example, the dash, right? It can be used to describe with exact precision. It can dramatize the consciousness of character. It can comically deflect, deflate, sorry, the gravity of a situation by invoking parody, right? And it communicates the breathlessness of the attempt of writing and brings the disclosure to a model of conversation, right? Stern was talking about, you know, writing when properly expressed, a managed is a different name of for conversation. But predominantly the thrust of this dash is to create a comic parody, right? And problematize largely the issue of language. But you know, I need to understand, I, I'm sure many of your teachers have also been harping on this, as to how language is perpetually full of slippages. <coughs> that language is a kind of a signifier, right? which acts as a, a lens between the signified and the person who is visualizing. So Stern's attempt is to problematize the gaps in language. So you see, this is where, you know, very importantly, Toby and Wadman's comic play of where Toby is wounded is played out. You shall see the very place, madam, said my uncle Toby. And, you know, immediately Wadman is blushing in the sense that her axis of language, as it were, is directed towards sexuality, whereas Toby's is directed towards the battle and the siege of Namu. So Wadman blushed, looked towards the door, turned pale, noticed the dashes, blushed slightly again, dash, recovered her natural color, dash, blushed worse than ever. I translate that. Lord, I cannot look at it, dash, what would the world say if I looked at it? I would drop down if I looked at it. I wish I could look at it. So he's dramatizing Wadman's interiority, no doubt, but at the same time, he's parodying the fact that between Toby and Wadman, there is a huge gap in terms of language. And also the La Fever episode, where La Fever is the soldier who dies and Stern very pathetically tries to represent it. But in pathetically trying to represent it, what he's trying to do is, is again comically parodying the novel of sentiment. Right? So nature instantly ebbed again, dash. The film returned to its place, dash. The pulse fluttered, dash. Stopped, dash. Went on, dash. Throbbed, dash. Moved again, dash. Stopped again, dash. Shall I go on, dash. No. You see what essentially Stern has done is 
he has exposed the way in which sentimental fiction deliberately tries to draw out our tears tries to tries to play upon the fact of suffering and through the dash is brought out the conventions through which fiction op op operates and that is what remains important so the first part of this passage takes realism to an extreme graphically depicting the ebb and flow the interplay of life and death but in the last class part the seriousness is dissolved into a comic metafictional gesture where the novelist asserts that it is his prerogative to stop this narration right so at the end of the passage what well, the novelist is telling you when can i stop i will stop when i want to this is my novel this is not true so once again through the punctuation the code of realism is challenged also very important in this slippage of language is this use of the asterisk and the bracket right so what it does is you know for example the word knows for example other words crevice and so on and so forth he points out how language is not uniform is not a clear lens it always has its slippages allows him to bring the multiple meanings into simultaneous play and it forces the reader to draw his own conclusion so the, one of the most important thrusts of stern is to force the reader to ponder about the status of the book as fiction the moment you are aware the author can self consciously make you aware that you are reading fiction it is at that moment you will try to challenge what are the codes of fiction just take an example you are playing ludo and somebody says well come on when it's six we'll put one and then you are immediately forced to come to the uh, come into awareness of the fact that the game of ludo says that six is a six and nothing but a six but if you change the rule right for example in different card games the trump card is different so you playing by a certain set of rules that is what stern is repeatedly bringing to the focus stern's use of the punctuation calls us back from the show to the showman so the raised voice the confidential whisper or the ink or the wink i'm sorry and therefore there is if this is punctuation then there are certain pictorial depictions which challenge or which draw attention to the conventions of plot now this is an example right so stern is saying how does my plot look and you see those different graphs that he's sort of drawing is suggesting that this book is proceeding through these kinds of digressions and in drawing the graph of the digressions is drawing attention to his crafting of the plot right so challenging once again the notion of the plot now once again there are certain things where stern is challenging the very expressibility of language itself how does one describe death you know the moment of yorick's death for example is boxed alas poor yorick and then this phenomenon of death itself cannot be conveyed therefore stern gives us the pictorial explanation of what cannot be conveyed the black page right so he's using pagination the visual aspect of the book as a way to challenge the fact that a book can and language can express everything suggesting that there are barriers that the novelist cannot cross this is another example and this way interesting you know 
Uh, let me see if I have one more. Uh, well, there was one more uh, page which I uh, should have put in, but I did not. When Stern says he's describing Widow Wardman's beauty, instead of a black page, what he puts in is a blank page. Now, why does he do that? He says that it is impossible for anybody to describe a beautiful woman. Right? So my concept of a beautiful woman might be very different from X's concept of a different beautiful woman and from a Y's concept of a beautiful woman. So what he's doing is, he's inviting the reader, you fill it in. And in doing so, he's making the reader a co-author. He's showing, once again, in doing so, is showing that the book is a work of art. It is artificial. It is crafted. Right. And finally, this is something which you need to know. And I, I, I was very fortunate in taking a look at the first edition of Stern's works when I went to his house. The curator actually showed me a few editions of this work. The first volume. You know, this you cannot see in your books, in your printed books. You see, there are marbled pages which depict the beauty of the book. At that point of time, because printing was in its rudimentary stage, every marbled page was different from the other. So you did not have offset presses which you know, produce similar looking marble pages one after the other. Then due to the impressions of the ink drying time, every marble page was slightly different from the other. So Stern is pointing out that every single book is a separate entity, right? Therefore, he's drawing attention to the fact that the book is a book and this is not life. And once you say that, then it is not, these characters are not real characters. This time is not real time. And the plot obviously is something which is carefully constructed by the novelist and deconstructed by Stone. Right? That is the way in which the challenge to plot character takes place. Now, I will slightly draw upon, you know, two characters here. One is Walter Shandy. In Walter Shandy, Stern uses the tradition of Menippean satire. Should you want to learn more about Menippean satire, my, my former students will, of course, remember my classes of uh, Swift. Swift's Gulliver's Travels as Menippean satire was a question that I probably asked them. Uh, <clears throat> You know, Menippean satire does not satirize any particular individual as such. It satirizes a particular philosophical position, an uh, idea, right? And in doing so, in Walter Shandy, Stern is, as I pointed out, attacking the idea of the pedantic scholar, the philosopher's gloriosus, right? Who's so immersed in his hobby horse that he can forget his brother's death through a lengthy treatise on death. So every time Walter Shandy comes to a particular idea, uh, I'm sorry, experience, he defines, tries to formulate an idea about it. And therefore, in this, Stern is playing very importantly. One of his major critics, Jefferson, talks about Stern's playing with learned wit in an imitation of Rabelais and Swift. And this gave him a speculative freedom, a dialectical ingenuity, which lends itself to witty development. So when you talk about Stern's you know, play with character, you have to mention this, that Stern is not creating Walter Shandy as a fully rounded character or as a human individual at all. He becomes part of a Manipian tradition where Stern is attacking the idea of the philosopher's gloriosus. And Toby similarly, is not a character at all. He is an attack against the sentimental naive. Right. Right. Somebody who is always perpetually engaged in sentiment and every experience is defined in terms of sentimental expression. So that is you. The principle of sympathy by which we enter into the sentiments of the rich and the poor 
the force of sympathy and the easy of sympathy of one human being to the other. Right. Take this episode, you know, where Toby picks up a fly and says, go, I'll not hurt thee. I'll not hurt a hair of thy head. Go, poor devil, let thee gone. Why should I hurt thee? The world surely is wide enough to hold both thee and me. So Stobie becomes the sentimental naive who looks at every experience through sentiment. But the problem remains that you see, Stobie is naive. He cannot cope or he's not suited and he becomes comically ridiculous. Right. So despite his sentimental rhetoric, Toby cannot communicate. Toby is as isolated as Wal Walter. And his interaction with Widow Wardman, you know, demonstrates his failure to communicate with a normal social point of view. You see, Shandy Hall, where these people live, is an isolated space, right, where both the characters fail to communicate. And Tristram True, whose name Tristram Magistus becomes Tristram as sad, whose nose is squashed, nose being the penis as well as the pen, right? Who can not forever light his life. So the failure of communication is an important, an isolation of man and failure of communication is an important aspect of the novel, right? So Toby's sentimentality not only isolates him, but leads to further importance. And sentimentality thus cannot offer a total release from the solipsism of rationality. Stern problematizes its limitations as well. So both of them are, as it were, locked into their respective philosophical positions. And that Toby, therefore, is naive rather than sentimentality cannot be a way of encountering life. And thereby, what Stern is doing here is creating a new author-reader relationship. Now, remember, in Fielding, Fielding said that the author is a tyrant and the reader must listen to whatever dictum that he gives. In Tristram Shanti, Stern asks the reader to be a co-participant of the act of writing. He says, write my blank page. He says, look at my plot. So he's always inviting the reader, right? And therefore, the protagonist of Tristram Shandy is not really Tristram at all. It's this process of writing and the reader's participation in it. And therefore, Stern seems to anticipate Wolfgang von Eiser's theory of reader response, where Eiser made this point that meaning of a text is somewhere created in the middle ground between author and the reader, right? And therefore, the reader becomes a co-participant, right? And therefore, Stern had admitted that the truest respect one can pay to the reader is to halve the matter amicably and leave the matter of the imagination to the reader, right? So that is a very important aspect of Stern. And Thackeray, as you can see, was very bothered by this, Thackeray being the uh, Victorian novelist. He says, Stern is always watching my face, watching his effect, and coaxing and imploring me. So, you know, the spotlight has turned away from the novel. It has turned to the novelist in the way in which he's constructing the plot artificially. And it's turning to you, the reader, who he's laughing at for believing that this is real. And therefore, his gaps, his leaps, blank pages, fragments are a comic fulfillment of the comment that nothing is lost. Right. Now, the last major bit of Tristram Shandy is the critique of Locke. So we've seen that Stern critiques Hume and sentiment and sees that sentimentality can lead to naive 
solipsism or withdrawal from life and comic miscommunication. The Stern also continuously keeps on mentioning the sagacious Locke. And what are the ideas of Locke that he disputes? This order of this order of things, right? Logical reasoning that you are now reading with Shudev, that experience leads to simple ideas, leads to complex ideas. But it's a structured way of reasoning. And the plot is similarly a structured way of reasoning. What does Stern do? Stern disrupts it into anarchic, random, back and forth. So the Lockean theory of order and understanding is ruptured. Locke suggested that language can represent reality and convey understanding. Stern disputes that idea. But very importantly, Stern says that he's using Locke's idea of association of ideas. What did Locke say? And I'm quoting Locke here. Listen to that carefully. Ideas that are themselves not at all of kin come to be so united in a man's mind that it is very hard to separate them. And they always keep company. So that the one no sooner at any time comes into the understanding, but its associate appears with it. And if there are more than two, which are thus united, the whole gang always inseparable, shoo themselves together. Right. Now, I'll, I'll give you a humorous example here of what Locke is meaning. We had a departmental excursion to Chandipur once. And in that excursion, Shudev twisted his ankle. And there was a girl who actually fell down and, you know, had a hematoma in, his, in her leg so that we had to take both of them to the doctor. And on the way, you know, suddenly people started stopping and saluting Shudev. So we were all very, you know, I, I was there, Dipankar was there. So we were all very surprised that Shudev has such global, you know, uh, acceptance amongst uh, people of Orissa. And then we asked the doctor and the doctor said, oh, you look exactly like the, the villain of a local Jatra opera, which is very, who is very popular here, right? So now whenever I think of Chandipur, I think about Shudev and I think about that moment when he injured his ankle so that what happens is uh, my point being that you know this is what Locke meant by the association of ideas so all of you have these things you know you think about something and immediately you associate with something else right so that is what Locke is saying is the association of ideas so ideas are of a family so if one comes, the other will also necessarily follow. But very importantly, follow this. What Locke suggests is that this is not how the mind operates. Whose mind operates like this? This operates, as Locke says, as a species of madness. So only mad people have random association of ideas. In normal people, Locke says, ideas are structured rationally. What is Stern doing? Stern is taking one idea of Locke, which is antithetical to the process of logical human understanding and making it the cornerstone of Tristram Shandy and praising the sagacious Locke for it. Right. So turn, Stern, I'm sorry, is turning this inside out and posits it at the center of the narrative. So Stern's treatment of Locke, too, is marked by a pervasive sense of parody. And if Locke is at the heart of recording empiricism and the realist novel, then Stern's parody of Locke is also a parody of the coherent notion of plot. He's using Locke's idea of madness to critique the idea of a coherent plot, right? And also in his language, when there are slippages of languages, language, then Stern is mocking the idea of Locke that language is a transparent lens.
So Stern is rejecting the philosopher's gloriosis. He's rejecting plot, realist plot. He's rejecting the notion of character. He's rejecting the notion of sentimentality. And he's parodying Locke. He's playing. You no, know, we started this with play. Stern's text is full of parodic, pervasive sense of play. Then you are at liability to ask so if he's playing with everything, then what is there? What does he acknowledge is there? And Stern's presence of what is there is actually two things. One is death, which is there. And Stern is writing perpetually in the shadow of death. Right. Uh, that is there. But to counter this, Stern uses a pervasive celebration of sexuality. Right? The only channel of communication that leads to human bonding. Right? And you see, the characters who are rejected, Walter Shandy, for example, says that our appetites are but our diseases. And Toby is, has strong suggestions of importance. Right? So the entire Shandy household denies any role to sexuality. Even the Shandy bull is found to be important. Right. So Stern is suggesting that any denial of sexuality in human life is a denial of life altogether and a denial of communication. Stern is also forcing us through language to acknowledge our pervasive sense of sexual awareness, right? And he uses the double entendre and language and pun. So when he repeatedly says nose, he clarifies by a nose, I mean a nose and a nose, the extended human of organ of smelling. And he immediately asks you. So he's not saying that I am being, you know, I am not a dirty old man, but you reader. Fair and softly gentle readers, not only men, but also women, where is thy fancy leading thee? If there is any truth in man, by my great grandfather's nose, I mean the external organ of smelling. So Stern forces us to bear the responsibility of the perversion of language, makes us and acknowledge that sexuality and sexual consciousness is present within each of us. And that, you know, therefore he's frankly raising it and stimulating it, trying to bring this taboo subject out of the closet into our greater consciousness. And he's also harnessing sexuality with imagination and creativity, right? Just, you know, look at the double author, he's talking about backwards and forwards movement, spurting ink all around, pen has been worn to the stump and so on and so forth. You can read it from the passage. So while Swift is warning us against the body, Stern is calling for a cooperation of the body and the mind and is celebrating the sexual body. And therefore, you see, Stern has been roundly criticized by a huge number of critics who see Stern as somebody who is, you know, who's, who's dirty, who's, who's somebody who's uh, licentious, who's profane. But Stern's point is that you know, sexuality is a means of communication rather than scholasticism or sentimentality. Right. So there are a lot of ideas which are circulating here. You have to understand that at one level, Kristam Shandy is a metafictional text in the sense that it sort of challenges plot, time, character. That is its technical aspect. But at a deeper philosophical level, Stern is re-examining the vital components of 18th century enlightenment philosophy. What were the two dominant philosophies? One was of rationality, organized thought, movement from 
sense experience to simple ideas to complex ideas. So the discourse of rationality is one road. And the other road is sentimentality as something that creates sociability. Hume, Adam Smith, and so on and so forth. Stern is suggesting that following any of these two roads blindly leads only to solipsism and isolation. Rather, what the Enlightenment did not acknowledge, the human body is a viable mode of communication. It's not religious, mind you. Religion saw the body as something corrupted. And this is remarkable because Stern was, you know, a clergyman. So for him to celebrate the sexual human body as a channel of communication and something which is important is extraordinary. Is extraordinary. Swift saw the body as a lump of deformity. Stern sees the body as a site of pleasure, something which is to be celebrated. Right. So in a sense, therefore, Stern is exploding many of the ideas of the Enlightenment itself. So there are two Sterns, as it were. One is the Stern who deconstructs plot, time, character, and the various aspects of the realist novel and thereby brings a metafictional dimension to the text. But that metafictional dimension is not merely for the sake of technique. So if you're asked a question, how does Stern deconstruct the notion of plot and character, you'll also have to add, why does he do so? He does so to explode the dominant ideas and question the dominant ideas of enlightenment, including rationality and sentiment, and highlights the presence of the human body as well, right, and celebrates it. So at a deeper level, Tristram Shandy is a very, very humorous, playful critique of the ideas of the enlightenment that we have read together. And along with sexuality, what he celebrates also is laughter. Right. And, you know, he's talking about the comic, he talks about writing a careless kind of civil, nonsensical, good humored, Shandian book. And he talks about Shandy's, that, uh, you know, Christian Shandy is one of the most cult books that was ever written. You tend to think of cult books only as something which is postmodern or modern. No, this is one of the first cult books ever written in the English language, which disrupted everything. Right. That it was a book which challenged almost every given technical philosophical aspect. And it says true Shandism in provoking laughter opens the hearts and lungs. It forces the blood to run freely into its channels and makes the wheel of life run long and cheerfully round. So Stern is refusing to, ex and you see, those of you who remember my discussion on Umberto Eco's The Name of the Rose will remember how laughter is seen by the priest and the follower of Aristotle as something which is anarchic, something which is like Antichrist because it destabilizes. You know, when you laugh at something, you destabilize order. So comedy is the world upside down. And comedy is something which has to be deliberately controlled. You know, uh, I'll give you a spoiler and say that in the great library, which Umberto Eco talks about in the name of the rose, the book which is which the priest tries to protect is Aristotle's treatise on comedy, which has now been lost. Why? Because he says that if Aristotle had written on comedy and sanctified it, then the entire institution of the church would have fallen down because the church draws upon seriousness. It talks about the vengeance of God. It does never talk about comedy because laughter would then commit a sacrilege against given notions of authority and religion. Similarly, 
You see, any kind of a parody is seen as dangerous by the authorities. So in celebrating laughter, Stern is refusing to accept any abstract system. He harmonizes the body, the mind, the imagination, the comic, plays one against the other. You see, this is the phrase that I'm trying to reiterate to you. The tone of Tristram Shandy or the entire trust of Tristram Shandy is continuous, relentless, obsessive sense of play, implying that any determinate, unified theory, that the Enlightenment was trying to project is fallible. So in a certain sense, what I'm arguing is, say if Stern's text is 1760, ballpark, and Richardson is 1740, then within 20 years, you see, the novel's codes of realism have been built and they have been deconstructed as well. So these 20 years, are, as, a, as it were, a kind of a microcosm of the history of the novel. That is what it has repeatedly you know, done. And I would like to refer to one particular critic whom, who uses Stern very often in his, in his discourses, is Viktor Shlovsky. Viktor Shlovsky, as you know, was a Russian formalist. In fact, Bakhtin belonged to that school as well. But Shlovsky said that history of literature is all about automatization and Ostranini, O-S-T-R-A-N-E-N-I, Ostranini, Russian word meaning defamiliarization. Stern is engaging in this process of defamiliarization. If Fielding was familiarizing the tradition of believable character and plot, right? Richardson is this great novelist of believable character. Fielding, of course, tries believable plot, then Stern is the one who encourages the Ostranini. So Victorian novel, drawing upon these quotes, modern novel, Ostranini, postmodern novel, defamiliarization, and Ostranini once again. So you see, how the history of the novel has been an extension of these debates of the 20 years of first 20 years of the novel. It is here that the novel is being debated, described, defined, and deconstructed. You see, when we talk about the 18th century novel as huge texts, which very many people are bored about, we tend to forget this is probably the most exciting period of the novel where something new is coming into being and something new is forever being, you know, it's like plastic, it's being molded and reshaped, challenged, thrown away and rebuilt once again, right? So when you look at the 18th century, don't take it as a kind of a dull, you know, age of reason. It's something which is simmering with different ideas, philosophies, genres and so on. Now, I will, of course, use one quote by Stern. So what did the novel mean at the end of the day? You know, you might, some of you might say, oh, he's been talking on and on and on. So what is Tristram Shandy? And in a letter to Dr. John Eustace, Stern uses this walking stick with many heads. You, you, many of you have seen these dadur churis, which, you know, sticks, which grandfathers used to, you uh, used to have. Earlier, these Walking sticks were very, you know, fashionable. And they had four or five heads, right? So handles, rather. So your walking stick is no, in no more sense more shandek in that of its having more handles than one. The parallel breaks only in this, that using the stick, everyone will take the handle which suits his convenience. In Tristram Shandy, the handle is taken which suits their passions, their ignorance or sensitivity. So if you want to read Tristram Chandy, you can read it for its sexuality. You can read it for its formal ingenuity. You can read it for its sentimentality. You can read it for its parody as of uh, the philosopher's Gloriosa. So it's a book with many handles, many interpretations, which ultimately goes back to the reader. 
Now, therefore, the reputation of Stern is associated with the stream of consciousness. You can see it as a kind of a novel of the stream of consciousness, where you know the randomness of the human mind is as it were referred to, and we find very strong as you know kind of synergies between Stern and Wolf. Remember Wolf talking about life not as a series of gig lamps, symmetrically arranged, but a luminous halo of thought. Stern talks about a series of cabbages planted and defies it. Equally, we can take a look at Stern as a postmodernist who lays bare the art of writing the novel. And the entire novel becomes an overt metafiction, which is about the construction of the novel altogether. That's why I've sort of suggested that it's one of the founding texts of English overt metafiction. Here's the man who we've all talked about. This is Lawrence Stern by Joshua Reynolds. This is the plot lines visualized, which I've already shown you. This, incidentally, is the Shandy Hall. This is the backside of Shandy Hall. And that's the Bowling Green. So that's where Toby would have made, you know, miniature versions, urban versions of his siege of Namur and the battle formations. This is the use of the asterisk, which talks about Toby's wound and the dash. Widow Wardman blushed, dash, look towards the door, dash, turn pale, right? So this is from the first edition altogether. This is a picture by Reynolds once again talking about Stern and death. You know, death, Stern was forever writing within the shadow of death. This is Stern, Hogarth's representation of the various figures here. You can see, uh, you know, Walter Shandy here in his comic posture. And this is Corporal Trim, who's reading out a sermon. And you have the baptism of Tristram, where the name Tristramagistus is lost, and Obadiah says that his name is Tristram, meaning sad. This is one of the early representations of Shandy Hall. I, I repeat, I was very fortunate to go there. You know, it's been my dream always to visit Stern and walk in the Bowling Green where Toby once walked. So, Oxford was the place where I, you know, spent almost three hours. This is Stern's parlor. This is Shandy Hall, once again, the fireplace. And this is the place where Walter would have probably sat. The fireplace, which has a very strong relevance in the novel. This is the marble page. You see, if you saw that earlier difference with the marble page, you can see how you know the first edition has a different marble page altogether. It's taken from a picture of the book that I could take there. This is the La Fever manuscript. So I actually took a look at the handwriting of Stern. That's Stern's handwriting. This is the Coxworld graveyard where Stern is buried. Uh, he was buried initially here, and then his grave was taken, and he was buried in Westminster. So uh, even in death, Stern actually moved, moved from one graveyard to the other. And well, this is me with whom I consider to be the finest English novelist I have ever read. And that is Lauren Stern and Tristram Shandy. Now, this class was not about just teaching. It was also, a, you can see, a labor of love. You know, those of you who, and I read realistic novels, thrillers, very voraciously. And I, at every point of time when I go to see a film, when I read a novel, Stern is the figure who's laughing at my back. I know that many of you will probably not read the novel at all, and you'll find this discussion rather uh, unanimated. This is not something which you're used to, you know. When you read a novel, you are used to believing it. When you are used to crying with it, you are used to laughing with it. But those of you who would like to very seriously and rigorously work on how novelists create their plots, 
and how self-consciousness is intrinsic within the novel to give one read to Stern and see how Stern is almost very magical in the way he sort of uh, takes a look or makes you take an alternative look at the way in which the game of fiction and realism is played between the author and the reader. So it is with that that I would like to bring this presentation, at least, and the recording to an end. And I will now take your questions.